Ruchel Magoim, again, sorry for being a little late, but uh, again, better late than never. The uh, lecture this week, on, uh, again, first Ruchel Magoim, let me wake you all to our home. Thank you very much for attending. The lecture this week on my thoughts um, is on Noah. So <clears throat> this week I would like to examine, again, the life of Noah. Now, even though Adam was the first man in creation, in reality, all peoples that are living in the world today are identified more so with Noah than with Adam. Adam was not naturally born into his world to a mother and father. He, he was initially fashioned by God Almighty as a lifeless mannequin of sorts, and then God blew into his nostrils the breath of life. He entered this world directly from heaven. His relationship with God was, so to speak, a match made in heaven. Noah, on the other hand, was a human being. He was born in a natural way to parents who were both humans. He was special, created with a very important and unique mission. On the other hand, he was very much human, as we observe through the information the Torah tells us about him and about his life. Now, the same Shem Yishmuel states that the Torah begins the portion of Noah with the words, Noah was a perfect tzaddik in his generations. Noah is referred by the Torah as Tamim, as perfect, whereas Avram Vino, Abraham our father, is not. Now, when the word perfect is used, what it does, it refers to circumcision. Since after one has been circumcised, they attain a certain physical perfection that did not exist beforehand. Now, God Almighty told Avrabino to circumcise himself so that he can be considered perfect. Noah, on the other hand, was already on this level, since, as it says in Abbas Reb Nassim, that Noah was born circumcised. The Zohar states that Noah is the Shabbat, and according to tradition, the Shlosha Regalim, the three festivals correspond to the three Abbas, the three fathers, Abraham, Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. The Rosh Chodesh, the blessing of the new month, corresponds to David Amela, King David. Now, the distinguishing feature of the Shabbat is that it is both permanent and unchangeable. It falls out every seventh day, as it has ever since the beginning of creation of the world, without any assistance from man. The Yom Tov, the, Chag the Chagim, on the other hand, is quite different. In an ideal Jewish society, <clears throat> the bathed in, the Jewish court, following command in the Torah, were instructed to proclaim the advent of the new moon. By doing so, it is the Jewish court's proclamation that determines which day of the month the Yom Tov will be celebrated. So the holiness of the holiday originates on earth and not in heaven. Now, Noah was a tzaddik. He, he was born with the soul of a tzaddik. However, he did nothing to change or develop that status in any way. As the Torah states in the last verse of the portion of Bereshit, that Noah found favor in the eyes of God. It was God's doing, not Noah's. Abram Avinu, Abraham our father by contrast, was a self-made man. The relationship that existed between himself and God Almighty came about only through his Herculean efforts. On his own initiative, in fact, the Medra says that at the age of 48, he sought to discover and only then did he attach himself to the creator of the world. This tenacity and self-sacrifice <clears throat> were passed down to his descendants. Now, following in his footsteps allowed them to draw down godliness into their lives, which can be compared to the concept of Yom Tov. So when the Zohar refers to Noah as a Shabbat-like individual. It did not mean to imply that he was holier than the Avot, each of which personified one of the three festivals. Rather, the holiness that Noah represented was qualitatively different from that of the Avot. Different, but not necessarily better. Noah's life was based on those gifts that God Almighty had blessed him with, which is very similar to the holiness of the Shabbat that comes automatically each week without any human assistance. Noah was holy like the Shabbat, but he failed to add to the holiness that he had been blessed with. In a sense, 
Noah was a spiritual cripple. He had only what God had given him, and he failed to add anything of his own. The opening verse in the portion states, As Holokim is Halak Noah, that God walked with Noah. Rashi states on this verse that Noah needed God's support to uphold him in his righteousness, whereas Abramavino, Abraham our father, strengthened himself and walked in his righteousness independently, motivated by his own efforts. So from this Rashi, we can learn the importance and the necessity of self-confidence, not conceit. Both Abramavino and Noah were tzaddikim. Yet Abramavino was successful where Noah failed. But why? Somehow Noah could not influence even one person to serve God. Whereas Abramavino was successful in converting many people into the service of the one and only God. The lesson that we learn from Noah is the importance of the number one. Once, one, once you have reached, pardon me, once you have succeeded in reaching the number one, then you have the ability to reach ten, a hundred, a thousand, the sky is the limit. But it all must begin, it must begin with the number one. Success begets more success. Noah never felt the joy of one. He therefore never developed a sense of self-confidence, a true belief in himself. That being the case, he did not have the ability to influence anyone. Rashi states, even Noah was one of those who had little faith. He was humble, but that should not have prevented him from influencing his generation, from being relevant. We see that Abram Avinu referred to himself as Ufer the Afer and the portion of Vayera, dust and ashes. And yet he still succeeded in his mission. Even Moshe, of whom the Torah testifies, was an Ish on the Ma'od, the humblest of all men was still able to influence a whole generation into the service of God Almighty. He was able to use that same trait of humility and become the greatest leader of all time, leading not only himself, but also his generation to greatness. So, so let us take a closer look at Noah and try to understand why he failed to influence anyone to attach themselves to the one and only God. You know, the Alkit Ruveni, based on Rehuda Chassid, states that Noah was the first person to be born with an opposable thumb. There is a debate among the commentaries as to whether the generation before the flood had webbed fingers or whether their hand would be, have resembled a, a paw. Being born with a thumb, the most versatile of all the five digits, thumbs are separated from the other fingers, which allow it to move in different directions different angles, and can touch the tips of your other fingers. Now, the thumb makes a major difference in every act that a person performs. It allows you to hold a tool, among other benefits, something that would have helped Noah greatly as the master carpenter who built the ark. Now, though a thumb may well have been a great advantage to Noah, however, to the people of his generation, hmm, it may have been perceived by them as a deformity. His peers may have viewed him as a freak from the moment of his birth. We know that children can be very cruel. Imagine how they must have chided him about his extra digit. God may well have orchestrated this scenario so that Noah would have automatically been shunned and separated from his generation. We read in the Torah in the portion of Lech Lecha, then when Abram Ravino and Sarah went down to Egypt during the famine, somehow, only then, did Abram Ravino recognize that Sarah, his wife, was physically a beautiful woman. As the verse states, Hine no yodati, that now I know that you are a beautiful woman. The word hine indicates that he found it strange, that somehow until this time he hadn't realized the fact before. After all, they, they weren't newlyweds. The answer the commentaries give us is that as he came closer and closer to the depravity and licentious lifestyle of Egypt, the more he felt that negative influence. As the Talmud tells us, that if one walks into a perfume shop and buys nothing, they still walk out smelling better. The same would hold true for an outhouse. Entering into the defiled atmosphere of Egypt 
made Abravina aware of her physical beauty. One can only imagine the overwhelming negative influence that the generation before the flood would have generated. <clears throat> we read that when God sent the angels who complained about the depravity of man down to earth, they sinned even worse than the humans of the generation did. If heavenly angels were unable to overcome the negative influences of the time, then how was a person of flesh and blood such as Noah expected to remain righteous and perfect before God Almighty? So to protect Noah, God blessed him with a deformity, something that would create a separation from his peers and at the same time bless the works of his hands. Since he was ostracized by the populace, he would have had very little contact with them. This would have acted as a protective shield of sorts, so that he would not have been influenced by peer pressure. This was another reason why he was forced to build the ark by himself. No one helped him since he was a social outcast. This may be another reason as to why no one took him seriously. He was seen as a freak of nature even before he began to rebuke the generation and build the ark. In addition, repeating his warning about a flood, destruction of the world for 120 years, may well have diminished the impact of his warning. Building the ark just added to his reputation as being different, and the ark itself may well have turned into a tourist attraction. When Noah was born, his father Lemach named him and said, Zeh this one, will bring us relief from our work and the anguish of our hands from the soil that God had cursed. Rashi states on this verse that until Noah was born, mankind had no implements for plowing, and he invented such instruments. In addition, before his birth, the earth was bringing forth thorns and thistles when they sowed wheat due to the curse placed on Adam, first man. So was his father a prophet? Well, where Mayer states in the Gemara, in the Talmud, that when a parent names a child, they actually do so with a sense of nevua, of divine inspiration. Nothing is an accident. It may well have been that seeing that his son was born with a deformity, that his father tried to put a positive spin on his birth and on his life mission. Inventing the plow did not enamor Noah to his peers at all. They still saw him as strange. He remained a social outcast. We, know we see a similar scenario with the life of Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, our teacher. Some commentaries say that he suffered from a severe speech defect, a heavy stutter. Others quote a medrash that stated that he had placed a hot coal in his mouth when he was just a young child, and it had caused him his speech impediment. In either case, it would have been difficult for him to speak properly. This would have made him a good listener and would have kept him out of trouble. You know, the more a person talks, the more trouble they can get into. People love a good listener. You know, there's a reason why God Almighty created us with two ears and only one mouth. We observe that as soon as Moshe gets older, he goes out amongst his brethren and, and tries to help them, only to get himself condemned to death for his troubles. He sees an Egyptian taskmaker beating a fellow Jew, and he kills the Egyptian. The next day he sees the same two Jews fighting amongst each other. He rebukes them to show their ingratitude for saving the Jews' life the previous day. They inform Paro that he had killed the Egyptian taskmaster. Moshe is then forced to run for his life. God may well have orchestrated this whole scene so that Moshe would perceive the whole Jewish nation as a lowly people, not worthy of God's salvation. We see that once Moshe leaves Egypt, he has no desire whatsoever to reunite, reunite with his people. When the Torah describes his initial meeting with the daughters of Yisrael, they refer to him as an Ish Mitzri, an Egyptian man. He has completely divorced himself from his people, so much so that when God orders him to take the Jewish nation out of Egypt, he refuses. God is forced to argue with Moshe for seven days before he will accept his mission. You know, they tell a story about an old lion who told his two young cubs that, that they should fear neither man nor animal. He told them that they were the king of the beasts. While they were out frolicking one day, 
they passed a fort. On the gates of the fort, they saw the image of Shimshon, who was beating a lion with the jawbone of a donkey. On the other gate, they saw the picture of Dabanamela, King David, who was tearing apart the jaws of a lion with his bare hands. Huh, they were terrified. They ran back to the old lion and told him what they had witnessed. They said to him, you said that we were the king of beasts and that we should fear no one and nothing, and yet we saw two lions being torn and beaten by men. <laughs> the old lion smiled. He told his young cubs that what they saw actually reaffirmed what he had told them. People only memorialize things that are unusual, things that are out of the norm. And that is why these two events were pictured on the gates of the fortress. They were the exception, not the rule. Had Moshe resided in Egypt, he would have continued to do all that he could to help his people. That being the case, there is little doubt that Paro would eventually have had him executed. In addition to the fact that familiarity breeds contempt, especially when it comes to being a leader. As the Talmud tells us, it's difficult to be a leader in a city where one has grown up. The fact that he had grown up as a prince in the palace of Paro automatically separated him from his people. And then <clears throat> he had been gone for at least 50 years, which allowed him to attain an air of authority. You know, there's a medrash that states that when God told Moshe that he wanted to destroy the Jewish nation after the sin of the golden calf and then begin a nation from him, Moshe replies to God, if you destroy them, he says, erase me from the book that you have written. The Hebrew word macheni can be broken up into two words. May Noah, the waters of Noah. There's another medrus that states that Moshe was actually a reincarnation of Noah. He was telling God that I made a mistake once before by not praying for my generation. I will not make the same mistake again. Before the flood, Noah underestimated his ability to influence his generation. He suffered from a low self-esteem. Then after the flood, he accepted the fact that he was now the father of all mankind. Realizing that fact, Noah decided to correct the sin of Adam, who ate from the tree of knowledge, which according to most opinions was a grape. So the first thing that Noah planted when he left the ark was a vineyard. His intent was to go back to the beginning of creation and somehow change the world. Therefore, he got naked in his tent, just as Adam was before the sin. What Noah didn't realize was that his physical makeup had weakened during his year in the ark. That being the case, the same amount of wine that he was able to consume before the flood that would have not have caused him to become intoxicated, now caused him to become inebriated to the point that he passed out in a drunken stupor in his tent. He once again misjudged the situation and his capabilities. Before the flood, he underestimated his potential. And after the flood, he overestimated his potential. We must learn to be honest with ourselves. Know who you are. The Torah begins by calling Noah an each Sadiq Tumim a righteous and perfect individual. But then after the flood, the Torah refers to him only as Isha Adama, a master of the earth. The first thing that he planted was a vineyard. You know, there's a story told that when Noah planted his vineyard, that the Sutton, the devil, asked Noah if he could help. He offered to water the vineyard. Noah naively agreed. He may have felt that he finally found a friend. And so the Sutton brought four animals. He slaughtered them and watered the vineyard with their blood. He brought a lamb, a lion, a monkey, and a pig. This then has become the history of drinking. Before a person drinks, they are meek like a lamb. Then they take a few drinks and they become strong like a lion. After they take a few more drinks, they become silly like a monkey. And then they continue to drink until they wallow in their own filth like a pig. So, who was Noah? The opening verse in the portion testifies that he was Ish Tzadik Tomim Hoya the Tzadik and perfect in his generations. At the same time after the flood, 
he is shown to be imperfect. From here we learn a great lesson, that to be a tzaddik does not mean that you are perfect. The bar is not set that high. However, no matter on what level one begins, we are all expected to grow. If we only look at Noah at the beginning of the portion, it would seem that he was only an actor, an individual whom God had chosen to play a part in a production called Before the Flood. He played the part as it was written. However, when the play ended and he entered into his private life, he could not retain that same level of perfection that his stage character had portrayed. Moshe, on the other hand, began as an Ish Mitzri, an Egyptian man. But at the end of his life, he was referred to by God Almighty as Ish Elohim, a man of God. Moshe, much like Noah, wasn't perfect. He did sin. But it wasn't his sins that defined his life. He ended his life with God testifying that he had grown. He had fulfilled his mission. He had become an Ish Elohim, a man of God. He used his sin sins as the Arida the Tzarechaliyah, as the descent for a greater ascent. It was his sins that helped propel him to his ultimate greatness. So based on the Midrash, Moshe was a reincarnation of Noah. That being the case, we learn a great lesson. Never, never give up. Though Noah may not have reached his potential on his first incarnation. However, in a second incarnation, as Moshe Rabbeinu was Moses, our teacher, he became an overachiever. We always need to remember that if you are on the road and there are no obstacles, hmm, then you are probably on the wrong road. Let us learn from Noah slash Moshe's example and never give up on our hope and desire for ushering in the coming Mashiach Sekeno quickly and in our time. Again, thank you very much for attending, for listening. Again, God should bless you all. Help us all to reach our potential. Again, God should bless you with safety and health and success and everything that is good. Shabbat Shalom. Again, thank you very much for attending.